Triple C, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi, everyone. Stephen Van Tassel here, wildlife control consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Glad to have you on board. Do take a few moments, if you would, and subscribe to the channel and ring the bell to be sure you're kept up to date with all new additions. And so as we're coming into here in the holiday season, I hope that you're spending, going to be spending some time with your family and friends because we're recording about, oh, nine, ten days out from Christmas at this particular point. So we're really glad to have you with us. Again, if you need to reach me, you can reach me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. That's wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com would love to hear your comments thoughts suggestions for new shows and yes even criticisms if you care to share those do visit us on facebook as well we have our pesky podcast family there join the revolution as franklin calls it so if you have questions comments there you can do a shout out and get some information from other colleagues out there. So we have a guest today. Her name is Melissa Schreiner. She's an entomologist from Colorado State University Extension, and she's located in the Tri-River area of Western Colorado that is sort of famous for its orchards. I didn't know you grew or had orchards in Colorado because it's and that your water problems must be a challenge out there with uh, trees. No doubt. <laughs> Soak up a lot of water. So, uh, but that's a subject for another conversation. So, yeah, she's going to be talking to us today about the kissing bug and its relationship to the bushy tail wood rat. And so, I kissing bugs really freak me out. And so, especially with Chagas disease. And so, if you're not familiar with that, well, then you're listening to the right type of podcast because we have an entomologist because they have the kissing bug down there in Colorado. You may not have heard of it here in the U.S., but we do have it here. And so, she's going to talk about us. And so, welcome, Melissa, to our what, Living the Wildlife podcast. Thank you so much, Stephen. Yeah, well, tell us, a little, tell us a little about yourself and your background and what got you into bugs and your present position. So it, it all started when I joined a youth farming program growing up, and I followed some of my peers up to study soil and crop sciences at Colorado State University as an undergraduate, and I took an entomology class there from our state entomologist and extension specialist, Whitney Cranshaw, mm -hmm. and I, I caught the bug, as they say, and I, I found a real passion um, to apply some of the skills that I had to, to a new field to me. Um, I, I knew plants well, but I hadn't ever um, really thought about what it would be to become an entomologist until I took this course and um, then pursued a master's degree working with Whitney. And um, we did heavy emphasis on horticultural entomology work, but Whitney as our state entomologist at the time, he's now retired. Um, he helped develop a lot of my instincts in extension, if you will. Um, yeah. I really, um, learned a passion from him um, while I was um, his student. So. So was he a state entomologist underneath the University of Colorado or was he hired was he hired by the state? So he was hired by Colorado State University, our land grant okay. institution. Oh, all right. So he was okay. a professor of entomology and then he had an extension specialist appointment and he worked at CSU for about well over 30 years. Yeah, I think I heard him speak. Didn't he publish a big book on I think it was identification of Yeah, insects. he has a garden insect book. Yeah, um, okay. He's done Pests of the West. He, um, yeah, he's well known for his work, um, his passionate work, um, working with stakeholders across the state of Colorado. Um, he just actually won an award through ESA. Um, oh, did he? He's a fellow now. So he oh, okay. um, was recognized this year for his, you know, many decades long work, um, interacting yeah. with the public, inspiring, um, you know, knowledge of insects and yeah. educating about them. Throughout I think I heard him speak about four years ago, I think, when he was up here in Montana. Well, uh, you have, uh, of course, the problem of kissing bugs, of course, and the you have, is it the bushy tail wood rat that's out in your particular area, or is it a different wood rat? So that common name I'm not familiar with. I The scientific names I was able to pull here were, yeah. let's see here, um, I know it's no, no um, neotoma species in general are what we yeah. refer to as wood rats. And right. what I was able to find was let's see here i can find my species information they in neotoma yeah neotoma so yeah Sonera? yeah so um i'll 
albigula, the western white-throated wood rat was sighted, ah. one of ours, and yeah. micro micropus, the southern plains wood rat. So ah, okay. the one right. I was able to find in some of my research, though, um, I think it's it's noted well that that genre of wood rats are um, what our genre of kissing bugs and in, interact with as hosts. Yeah. So, so w- what's the deal with those? With those, I'm not familiar with those two wood rats. So uh, we don't. We have the bushy tail wood rat, which does go down into Colorado, but it must not be on the western side of the divide. It must just be because it doesn't have. I don't think it goes far into your state. But uh, so, what is the deal with this kissing bug and its relationship with these wood rats? So, so basically, these these wood rats are obviously, you know, they're they're in wild areas. Um, our issue here in my county happens to be in areas where folks have inhabited um, and built out along cliff faces and within um, very rural areas of canyon lands. So um, folks will even build homes within um, or alongside canyon walls. And mm-hmm. of course, these pack rats that live in in that environment then are very close to these human in you know, the structures that we inhabit. So it it can be quite a problem um, for, for folks that um, are almost living out in, you know, very much in a wild environment. Um, It's not necessarily that um, these are, you know, domesticated relationships with um, triatoma species. We do have kissing bugs that are more related to, you know, they will just feed maybe on domestic animals or, will just feed on humans, but the, the type of kissing bug that we have here is triatoma protracta. And it actually, it's just interacting with these wild populations of pack rats, but now humans are, are in the equation They're They're moving into the, those wild spaces out here right. in, in Western Colorado. So, so the kissing bug feeds on the wood rat. That is correct. So, okay. um, Kissing bugs in general, um, they they feed on vertebrate animals. It can be a wide a range of vertebrates. Um, in in our case, I believe mainly it's it's man it's mammalian species that yeah. are typically targeted worldwide. Kissing bugs are an issue in in the New World. I mean, all the way down into you know the tip of Southern America, we have issues with kissing bugs. And typically, the you know the famous encounters with Chagas disease and kissing bugs and humans are typically thought of more in the areas of Mexico, the Caribbean islands, Central and Southern America are where we have really big issues with Chagas right. disease. And um, yeah, so basically, I mean, cone nose bugs are, they feed off the blood of various types of vertebrates to reproduce and um, to sustain themselves. They they need that the blood of that particular host species. Yeah, it's, I think that there's, I, I've read somewhere that the kissing bugs that we have don't seem to be good uh transfers of shagus because i one article i read and it's a little dated so i'm a little worried whether that's still true or not and that is it said it was kind enough not to defecate on your face after it bit you (laughs) that is correct so okay see that we have here in western colorado triatoma protracta yeah um, it does not um it does not defecate directly on the host. And in that case, it can, it can spread much easier. Um, and if that's the case, so tritoma protractor actually doesn't um, defecate on, on its host. And in that way, it, it does actually help quite a bit. Um, but to date, um, we right. don't have any recorded in infections of Chagas um, okay. disease from Colorado. We, um, in general, the interest of around the kissing bug in our area was sparked when we had national press um, go out that reported that an organism um, that can produce Chagas disease was detected in Colorado. And so this news coverage back, I believe it was 2019 or um, 2020. Okay. Um, this news coverage was, you know, written in a way that reported um, um, actually in a way some correct, incorrect information. They, they got some of the species of triatoma wrong. Um, they suggested that it was actually the eastern species that maybe had extended its range and was now found in Colorado, and that's not the case. We believe that Tritoma protracta has, you know, had a long relationship with wood rats in our area. Right. Um, but it's it's important. Yeah, it's it's important to note that um, you know the the awareness of Chagas, you know, in Colorado is is really due only to the fact that um, 
it's, you know, been recently detected from um, a species. So we, we were able to find it in the excrement of, okay. of Tritroma protracta here, but it has not been um, vectored to a human being in our state to date that I was able to find in the record. So yeah. Okay. So, and so I would assume you would have had, so if someone tested positive for Colorado right now, they would probably be, they contracted it somewhere else and then moved. It's very possible. Yeah. So yeah. Um, because of the nature of that, you know, this, this parasite that causes Chagas disease lives in, um, in the feces of, of kissing bugs or cone nose bugs, as we also call them. And, mm -hmm. but due to the habits of the Western cone nose that we have, it's considered to be, you know, poorly capable of transmitting this parasite to humans compared to other species of cone nose bugs that, um, we would say, let's, you know, we'd find in Central or Southern America. Yeah. Um, Do you and, do Sorry. you have an idea how far north the the proper vector is in terms of is it has it broken through the southern borders? I, I thought I heard that it was in southern Texas now. I want to say I have heard it's in southern Texas, but I have not heard of a more northern. More than um, that. OK, so it I seems to be just barely that's kind of temperature. It. Is it a probably a temperature thing? I think it's temperature, it, humidity, um, obviously host preference. This is a, a group that there's really strong. Um, favoritism yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure but, but our western cone nose is um it's not really considered to be you know you know a, a an, an issue with chagas because like we were saying um the organism is not transmitted when the insect bites it's when that feces is in the situation and because our our cone nose bugs are basically going to the bathroom somewhere else that okay. that helps a lot um when hosts get bit um, and then they scratch their wounds and they they can rub, you know, mucous membranes like eyeballs, they, you know, Chagas disease could potentially happen. But the likelihood of this happening with a human is is very slim to none in, in our state. Um, OK, we feel. Um, but yeah, no human cases of Chagas um, have right. ever been reported here in Colorado. And um, but it has been detected in in the feces of Triatroma protracta, our western cone nose. So, right. so it's not possible. to say that it's possible. So it right. you know, just hasn't yeah. been. Well, that's that kind of nuance. Well, that's actually more comforting. So what it does mean for pesticide applicators who may have a client or a vertebrate pest controller who's dealing with a client with wood rats or your bush with your uh, wood rats, we would, he would need to keep, he or she would need to keep that in mind that it is a possible risk for the client and maybe even themselves. I mean, do, do these insects ever hitch a ride? I mean, is that common for them or? So in, I think in areas like Central and Southern America, it can be very common that they are vectored easily. Um, mm -hmm. They also are quite strong flyers. They're attracted to lights. Um, mm -hmm. In areas where they are more associated with the, you know, domesticated animals like poultry, um, you know, it can be a big issue with them getting into our our human dwellings in those okay. areas. But but in our area, I mean, they really are very much out in um, the middle of the desert, and very few people really do live there. Though in our area. Um, south of Fruta, the city of Fruta, Colorado, um, quite a ways, there is some developments that are very much built within um, canyon lands. And right. so we have had some positive detections of Triatroma protracta when, in particular, when um, when middens are abandoned, um, mm -hmm. these, these uh, Western cone nose bugs are they're able to last for months without a blood meal. I don't think it's quite maybe a year, but they can last for quite a while, even wow. um, into like a scenario could happen where a midden is abandoned and then could be re um, re-inhabited by wood rats. And um, yeah, it was just this, uh, I think it was just this uh, June or July, I had a nymph turned in and it was absolutely, I knew right away, it's a very creepy looking insect in general, but um, that very cone nose shape allowed me to, you know, have, have worry. And I investigated closer and um, this individual that had brought it in actually had had them in the past and they hadn't been at their house for quite some time. They don't live in their, their, their home built into the Canyon year round. And when they arrive, they always do it an inspection and they, they work closely with pest management professionals because the area has been 
you know, priorly documented to have Western cone nose. Um, okay. Yeah, it's, it's quite an so interesting. What it, uh, so other than let's let's leave aside the removal of the wood rat. OK, let's. So if I'm a homeowner and I'm in and so I, I'm in wood rat country in Western Colorado and I'm worried about whether I have this particular insect in my home what would you what would your be your professional advice to someone how what would be the ways that they would mitigate possible exposure again we're, we're leaving the wood rat aside for now because that'll be like the next question okay but what would what should someone do that's tough i mean really locating if wood rats are in the picture is is number one so okay. i think super is jumping to mind there but i mean if you were to locate a wood rat nest, you would absolutely want to work with a pest management professional to, to get rid of those wood rats, okay. um, complete removal or sealant, you know, sealing yourself away from those, those areas is number one, because it's so hard in the house, hard in the house. I mean, and of course, um, you know, removal of, can, um, of debris piles like shingles, or, I mean, when folks are building homes, um, Anything in proximity to your structure that could be used as um, suitable habitat, um, okay. piles of wood, um, would you know rock piles? I'm trying to think of other examples, but um, that could Brush be piles, yeah, piles. could be an attractive shelter site for western conos. Um, okay. So just yeah, trying to exclude yourself from them, but you know, some on the behavior of uh, Tritroma protracta and a lot of kissing bugs is they're they're very stealthy. They're lurkers. They creep along um, cracks and crevices. They they hide very, very well. Um, they're quite flat insects. They can mm -hmm. sneak in and out of very small spaces. So sealing your the perimeter, you know, having a perimeter spray or some type of barrier, we can get into insecticide use. But I think having, you know, really tight window seals and, you know, caulking cracks. These are really important um, precautionary things that we can do to try to prevent them entering our, our structures. So would there, are there any traps or lures that attract them? There are some attractants and I wish I had looked into them a bit better. I actually was just reading about a few hours ago that there, there are, there's some um, efficacy with um, baiting them and, right. um, but also just, um, repellents uh, are a big um or big site i think for future investigation just to see oh, really? how, okay, how okay. well those how those how those work um so you said they were attracted to light so would light traps for flies be effective it's in in areas especially in central and southern america i do believe that they they would okay. use light as as a tool yes. so is there a particular bandwidth of the uv spectrum that they're primarily is it white light that they're attracted to like we, we usually tell people to go with the yellow lights to try to reduce insect pressure does that you know i wish also... i knew more i can't really speak to it i'm, I'm okay. unsure of what light spectrum they're most attracted to um though it's likely in the literature yeah okay all right and and what about uh actives that would kill them i mean uh, so i, I mean any contact, you know, pyrethroid. Pyrethroid um, would do it. Pyrethroids are very eff efficacious against. So, mm -hmm. so if someone trapped the trapped the wood rat, let's say the wood rat is deceased. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that's legal in your state. We always follow state law, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> don't just go whacking it because it's there. You know, you have to make sure you're going to be legal. But let's say the the wood rat is gone. Would that someone would just then, yeah be treat would be treated for pyrethroids treat the treat yeah, the nest in mittens area yeah and that's then correct. what wait several days and go back and actually try to remove that nest or continue yeah to... I think or to uh, you know appropriately seal it off that's been done um, however like bury it go, yeah I mean I think yeah I think I think burying or trying to collapse the midden or excavating out that material I'm I'm actually unsure of how exactly. Yeah. Um, you would attack that. Um, that would be hard. It would I mean, be I'm just... extremely difficult to even, I mean, especially in big slabs of rock, you know, canyon wall. Um, oh, I see. It turns they're, ceiling they're up about, in the yeah. cracks of this canyon and it's like almost phys it's physically impossible to actually reach uh, yeah, just really where they are. So you have to, in a profound way, seal off your, 
your dwelling. Um, yeah. So actually, okay. this this uh, this homeowner that had had uh, cone nose, a positive detection this year in 2022, um, they had been over the years working with a pest management professional, and um, it was that you know this uh, this one area um, where they suspect there's a midden that had gone inactive has become active again, and there are likely yeah. pack rats that they they were not able to you know detect before unfortunately finding a nymph crawling around on i think it was a hallway or a bathroom floor so i mean these people when they enter their home after you know not being there um wow. for a period of time they have to do a you know hands and knees on the ground your face is looking for um for these nymphs i couldn't i signs. couldn't hit. I couldn't handle that. I don't think I could handle that. It's I think I have remote, a, a, yeah, where these folks are living. Not not many folks are are encountering this. It's not a very popular problem. This was a yeah. very unique inquiry this year. But yeah, I think I'd be putting out a lot of blue boards probably in just to see it maybe near the windows, because I would if I'm assuming if they're attracted to the light, maybe they'd go to the window and then drop down. I don't know. I just think I'd Ooh, I just, it's just, they just creep me out. <laughs> well, they, they are, I mean, them being, yeah, blood feeding. And I mean, there's yeah. very little to no pain when you're bitten. It's almost yeah, yeah. impossible to detect um, okay. when you've been bitten. Um, you know, typically they attack, they are nocturnal and they are associated with hosts that typically are diurnal and, you know, are sleeping at night so that they can access their prey or resting at night. It doesn't have to be sleeping, but um, they are very, you know, they're subtle in a lot of ways. And I think that makes them, you know, creepy. creepy. To me. Yeah. Yeah. And so are they, would someone know that they were bitten? Is that, what's the likelihood of someone knowing they were bitten? Um, during the active bite, actually, it's very hard. Right. To yeah, I, I'm assuming. Um, but I, I would, know. I would assume afterwards. Some people actually have somewhat of an allergic reaction. Okay, like a um, mosquito. So, yeah, okay. so you would have some type of welting or raised bump, um, some type of redness, um, maybe an itchy type pain. Um, but yeah, the there's many substances in you know, try to mine saliva that um, are. Let me see if I can get this word right. Um, they're uh, they basically um, have ana, analgesic, I think is the word. Oh, analgesic. Okay, analgesic. so it has a right, analgesic so it properties. Thank you. Yes, makes it uh, pain less pain. Yeah, so you almost can't detect that. So, um, but some people do have kind of an allergic reaction to them, um, and they then you know would notice they have been bitten. Been. And uh, I can talk some on some of their their behavior with, uh, um, but pretty much, um, yeah, wherever they're found and whatever habitat they're found, they're, they're very secretive insects. Um, they, um, like I said, they, um, prefer shaded crevices and, you know, they, the, the nymphs, you know, camouflage themselves with dirt and debris can be very hard to detect, um, that you have them in your dwelling. Um, Tritomes feed um, if a host is available. Um, I think the literature I read said every four to nine days. Um, but um, if there's a lack of a host, they can last for months. I don't know. Um, I've I've read literature on bed bugs that say they last right. to a year without a blood meal. I couldn't find quite yeah, that I, long for kissing I, bugs, but I would yeah. wonder how long can they really go without a blood meal? It's quite a long time. Yeah, I would think, and also with bed bugs, I think that's like perfect environmental conditions i think with that too and yeah so it's that's like that's yeah. on the high end yeah so it's yeah, really it's to... multiple months that you um you can have uh you know nests get abandoned by wood rats and um this insect tritoma protracta in our area just, can persist just, for quite just, a significant amount of time yeah, yeah. until you know a host maybe even will return to that nest um or re-inhabit it um okay. You said they're strong flyers, so they could theoretically fly to a new nest if they felt like it. They, they, yes, they could. And in areas where they're very commonly encountered, um, you know, along human dwellings, they, they are constantly flying to porch lights and, you know, entering homes um, okay. that way. So let's talk about their life cycle a little bit. So how, do you know how many, how many stages they go through or what their, what the mating process is? And then how does that, how do they progress? Yeah. So, um, I know some, um, they, so they're in the family, Reguviidae. I wanted to talk some just on, mm -hmm. on sure. um, 
that whole group of insects. But um, Regivity, there this is a large morphologically diverse group, um, and the majority of them that are described are are predators. They're actually you know considered beneficial insects. The mm-hmm. the one exception of this entire family is the subfamily Triatomini. Right. So um, these kissing bugs or cone nose bugs, um, you know, that we're discussing today. Um, they're, they're easily confused with some other members that are actually quite good insects. Um, um, in general, of course, you know, they're feeding, they're feeding on blood, of course, but let's see here, where's my section on that? Um, in general, you know, Regiveids, they're, they're a type of true bug. They have piercing sucking mouth parts where, you know, the majority of the, the family that this insect is in, all of these members are, are using that piercing sucking mouth part to attack another insect. And it's, right. you know, that's considered a, a beneficial service. But in this case, you know, triat- triatomines are, are stabbing us with their mouth parts to drink, to drink blood or of their host in particular. Um, but it, for, for many, um, Regivids and hemipterans, they have five nymphal stages. Um, you know, nymphs are distinguished by having smaller eyes, you know, a lack of wings. They lack ocelli. Um, both sexes of adults and nymphs, um, they will require blood for development. Um, females will mate um, every, at, about one to three days after their final molt, and um, they'll deposit one to two eggs daily. Um, about 10 to 30 eggs in their lifetime. And um, they can, on the higher end, I think about a thousand eggs was um, was seen out of one adult female oh. in her lifetime. So, but the, the number on average is about 200 eggs. Um, they're laid mainly singly um, on a substrate. Some species will glue their eggs to that substrate. Um, but their entire life cycle can be as short as three to four months. Um, and the average is about one to two. So it's a pretty quick, quick life cycle from egg to the end of an adult life. So, so born in spring and mature by the end of July, August, and they're ready to start dumping out eggs, September. I don't know. When does it start getting cold in your area? So it can be from, we can get early frosts in October. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, mainly November is considered, I would I think it's considered a colder month. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's, um, there's so many things that drive, um, you know, development times, of course. Sure. So um, factors like, it, like we were discussing earlier, environmental temperature, humidity, availability of hosts, um, different feeding intervals among different species. Um, nymphal diapause can be um, quite, depending on the area can affect things as well. So and diapause means what? Diapause is, um, so it's not really hibernation, but it's a period okay. where the insect's metabolism rate drops and okay. they are, they're, um, there's not a lot of activity and they're typically, um, you know, sheltering through an environmental change, like cold temperatures, like throughout a winter. So they have just gradual metamorphosis then? There's not a complete metamorphosis. That's they, so they they look the same, just smaller as a nymph. Yeah. Through and the then, five stages. Yes, through the five stages, yes, they look very okay. similar. And um I think, you know, the adults compared to the nymphs, I think they look quite different. Um the adults okay. are have more of a shine and they've got, you know, obvious wings on wings. them. Um the nymphs, um yeah. I, they're they're not quite as black they're maybe more of a reddish color um okay. don't have that shine maybe quite like the adults do but any tips on identification of the the problem kissing bug versus the other the so, non-problem yeah. kissing bugs because when i look at them on a book i'm like gosh they're they're looking awful close the same yeah but, <laughs> but do see, i need a microscope or do could there uh, is there some thumbnail ways to help narrow at least the search down a little bit well i know that the the number of mouth parts so i believe it's four segments that triatroma species have um but i think even the main problem that i find is it's other regiveid species that are Mm. so similar in the way that they look and they're very common insects especially in colorado homes so i mean yeah some of the lookalikes are um we have bee assassins, so you know Apiomeris species, uh, masked hunters. These are really good insects, especially you know found in in our gardens. And um, masked hunters, they're 
their nymphs even disguise themselves in very similar ways to triatoma species. Um, okay. They have wheel bugs, you know, the more south you go, um, western conifer seed bugs. These, these lookalikes, I would say, are almost, you know, more of our problem for probably homeowners or pest management professionals to, to detect against. So I just, I advise, you know, be really careful and make sure that you don't, um, make an identification too soon and, you know, seek a professional um, pray pray. to help confirm your finding. And so don't often, just spray and pray. Yes, Maybe get, a, get an ID so. first before you start carpet bombing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Especially because there are so many individuals in this family um, that are actually, um, the majority of them, you know, more than 99.9% of them are good insects yeah. we want around. Um, but yes, of course we do. We do have that exception. And of course that is the kissing bug. So, so for our Colorado listeners, would they be able to package one and send it to you or do they send it to a state location if they needed an ID, if they didn't have an in-house entomologist in their corporation, their company? What, how, what would be the process for that? Yeah, so the Colorado Department of Health and Environment has taken a role on of, you know, investigating these species. Um, we have a medical entomologist, Chris Roundy, who's great. Um, the year I've worked here in Extension, um, they've been great collaborators. Um, typically, um, you know, if if one of these suspected conos, conoses or kissing bugs were found, you know, you would start by trying to contact, you know, maybe a local county ag agent. They would then okay. contact maybe you know, their regional entomologist myself, and I, I would be able to, you know, make contact with the Colorado Department of Health and Environment okay. on behalf of the individual. That's what happened this year is I, I, I notified our Mesa County Public Health individual, and I also notified the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, and they are there to help support. They've got great, a great website built out on, you know, some of their work that they're doing here. Um, but yeah, I would say if you are in the Colorado area, you know, by all means, don't hesitate to reach out. I would be happy to help provide an identification confirmation. And so would the folks at the Colorado Department of Health and Environment. So, all right. so the process is if you find a, a, a cone nose bug, we'll just call it cone nose bug, and you and you were wondering whether it could be the tri uh, triatoma protracta. Is that the right one? The right Correct. one? Yes. So if you think it's that, contact your local extension educator, ag agent in your area. It's part of the Colorado University Extension Program. Start there. Uh, then they will take it to the next step if they think it's going to go up to the. If you take pictures, take good pictures, folks. Um, pictures, but they probably need to have a microscope, it sounds like, in order to really do the positive ID on it. Yeah, typically even an ag agent would likely um, send it on to me. And I mean, because there's so like that, those masked hunters in particular being like jet black, just like the, you know, triatoma species that we have, um, protracta, um, you just want to make sure, I mean, there, it's really not a common problem that you would find a cone mm -hmm. nose, but it, it is, it would be common that you would find, you know, one of the lookalikes. So, right, you know, most right, likely right. if you find something, you want to rule out first that it's not a good guy that you're thinking is a, a bad guy, if right. you will. And so how would they package these? What would be the best way for them to package the sample? Uh, I'm assuming if someone said, well, I have 30 of them right here, it's probably not triatoma protracted. They don't, they're not a aggregating insect, right? So they're more isolated. Yeah, You'll likely find, you know, one of the look like or triatoma protractor would be, you know, I I, have, I would see that, you know, maybe in the nymphal stage, they would be very easily confused, very hard to tell apart. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that, you know, once you have the specimen, putting it inside, you know, a non-breakable rigid container like Tupperware or okay. a vial um, yeah. would be great. Typically, um if it's an adult, you know, it'd be fine to turn in without preservative, but, but nymphs don't preserve as well without, you know, a preservative agent. Like, um, typically it would be ethanol, um, ethanol. Um, I have seen people turn in isopropyl alcohol. Insects get a little rigid in isopropyl, but, um, okay. it's good to have a preservative so that that insect in transit to, to me or to, you know, where it's going doesn't decay and cause issues for, you know, confirming its identification. Um, okay. But yeah, it's it's common that you would likely stumble upon it when you're, you know, when I was cleaning out um, the the shed 
um, at a farm I was working at before I was an extension. Um, I, I found a nymph of a masked hunter and I could see people, um, easily coming into contact with, um, a lookalike, um, mm-hmm. that would maybe throw them off. You know, they may say, Oh no, this looks so similar to yeah. a kissing bug. Um, but even yeah. the nymphs would be lar- big enough to, to bite us obviously. And so there's a potential for small, but a potential, uh, for, a contraction of Chagas disease on that way. Do they have, do they know where the, the parasite comes from? Is the wood rat a host or a reservoir of Chagas disease? Really good question. Um, I'm unsure actually. Okay. Yeah. And so do you, do you have any information in terms of how, I mean, cause people can be infected with Chagas and not even know it. My understanding is, is that it could be decades before they're typically, I think it's a heart condition that occurs yeah, it, with it. Have some symptoms here. Um, it starts with fever. It, your glands enlarge. Okay. Anemia, um, a disturbance of the nervous system, uh, but also um, the cardiac system. Um, okay. No, those, are those late symptoms, or do they occur even after the after the bite? I'm wondering what the long what the what the prodromal phase is, which is the non symptomatic phase. Yeah, I think these these occur, you know, probably well after you've, you know, been bitten and have had it. So I'm, okay. I'm not yeah, totally yeah. sure initially. I know that it said um, fever pretty initially. I mean, your body is okay. trying to fight something off. That would maybe be a sign. Um, uh, okay. So if you have a bite around, if you have a bite around your lips and is, is it, does it typically the lips and, and why is it the lips? And that's where they get that kissing bug name. It's such a good question. Um <laughs> Is, I'm not is sure it the, I really know the is the it the answer. blood flow and the fact the it, skin's different? Did they just very not able possible to possible that I know people have been bitten all over the face? Um okay. you know, historically that's been documented. Um okay. I would imagine just the sheer amount of um you know the heat that's registered because of all that blood flow in your face. Mm. You have a lot of blood and a lot of um I would I would imagine maybe that's a, a Temperature wise, maybe a hotter part of our body. It's also where we're admitting CO2, and that's something yeah. that can attract. Uh, okay. Um, so, a CO2 well. trap like could be a possibility for the kissing bug then? It could be very interesting. I don't know what research has been done using CO2, but I yeah. would, that would be an area of future research if it hasn't already um, been investigated. Yeah, I almost feel that this is almost like an orphan problem in the sense that it's such a small market it that won't get the attention it probably deserves because it could get ugly for some people and the problem is there's no cure that i'm aware of of shagas disease i couldn't find one either there is none and it's yeah so this is serious i mean we either prevent it because it doesn't seem that we can like you know penicillin it you know and just you know you're done so that's a and it's a devastating illness from what i understand it can really ravage someone's life later on yeah it can, um, be, it can be horrible and it affects um i think you know all ages you know it can be really can be pretty devastating i just the mm. pictures from my medical and veterinary entomology textbook are it's terrific yeah, yeah horrific it's to see ter- what terrible. People, yeah what people suffer i mean and maybe this you know mainly i mean say this is happening you know of course in central and southern america right um, the, you know, the World Wide Health Organization is involved in helping to solve some of these issues, you know, down in right. areas of Brazil and, you know, you know, where there's really top. How, how would you solve it? How would you solve it? I mean, just where would you start? I mean, it's, how would. It's really challenging to think about how they, you know, in areas where, you know, they didn't even really know where they, you know, just mapping the distribution and then figuring out how can they go in, you know, working with pest management professionals in these countries, right. how can they you know, have a community wide approach to, you know, helping to solve these issues. And really it comes down to, you know, providing that education and, you know, getting boots on the ground to go out and really educating these communities on how they can, you know, prevent. um, But do they even have the resources to harden their structures to keep the bugs out? Quite difficult with how, you know, um, intertwined, um, you know, these, these insects are with human dwellings. I mean, chicken coops and, you know, cacti and wooden roofs that um, can provide shelter. I mean, it's just, it's so hard to say with, you know, these insects so commonly in the environment. Um, It's it's 
hard to get it, all that information to, to the folks that really need it. I, I know that there's yeah. been massive efforts um, throughout, you know, this, um, you know, the beginning of, you know, from 2000 on, I know there's been like really heavy work done. Heavy work um, in the area. In the well, area. You, you, you've mentioned chicken coops several times, a couple of times here. And I, I'm intrigued by it because I do think as more and more cities make the mistake, in my opinion, of allowing residents to have chicken coops. I think it's amazing. You know, Americans have very bad historical memories. Um, we really don't mem remember, which is really good because we don't hold grudges as much as other countries do. But um, but we really have a bad historical. You know, you think about bed bugs and the association with chickens. You look at you know the fact that all the feed grain and the rodent issue. You know, no matter how good of a producer you are in, you know, your little backyard thing, you're not going to keep all that grain out of mouse hands. I mean, just, I don't know how that's possible. I mean, it's, I, maybe somebody will invent. And now you have, I'm wondering if this particular triatoma, could it, could it feed on a chicken or is it really just tied to this wood rat? I mean, that's yeah. just its thing. It's that it's Typically, really that tied. Yeah, it's it's very tied. I mean, wood rats um, are the only documented host, and I really feel that. I mean, the literature documents well that um, they, you know, have species specific. Um, they have favorites. I mean, they right. really don't cross over that too much. There is a host preference complex with this whole um, subfamily. Yeah, I, here's, here's where I'm nervous about that. And I, and I'm not doubting what you're saying. Here's where I'm nervous. And that is, you know, I'll have a favorite food because that's the only food I can get to, <laughs> but, you know, but, you know, if you, if I'm in, you know, if I'm, if we're in a different situation and all of a sudden someone starts raising some chickens and that becomes available and, Again, I'm not an entomologist, and I'm not claiming to be one. But I've it. You read literature sometimes with with a woodchuck. I had a colleague out of Connecticut. He said, "You read the literature, and it says woodchucks hibernate alone." And he said, "Not true." I've had he had a situation where he trapped like six hmm. out of a burrow, and they were clearly hibernating together. But it was an it was the impact of urbanization and how they had overcome or adapted their behavior to the conditions on the ground that they were encountering. And I just get, you know, I'm like, you know, I'd like to have, you know, maybe someone could do an entomological study and, you know, put a bunch of chickens in a room and a couple, a few triatoma and then, you know, watch them. Uh, then I'd feel better about it. You know, if they starve to death and then I would be okay, well, maybe they won't feed on it, but I'm just like, you know, I just, just, I just, I don't know. With so many changes. I mean, I know that, you know, this maybe for our area wasn't necessarily historically an issue. I think it's right. Yeah, more that's more of an issue. So as in the, as our environment changes, as yeah, that's what I'm areas about. That yeah. we just haven't historically developed out and we start mm -hmm. encroaching in on you know um more pack rat middens it, it right. easily could could be the case um I, that i, I would think so yeah. change. i mean we don't want to completely rule out that that is a possibility as right as insects are quite adaptable as you have pointed out oh I, well i i you know i'm just saying i'm just talking about the the vertebrate side you know it's just you just kind of wonder i mean even bat bugs i'm told you know they will they they like bats but they will come down and bite humans. They can't really, I guess they can't thrive on us. And so it really does, they get, yeah, they bite. So it doesn't work very well, but. We get lots of bat bugs um, in our area too. We, we're a pretty good bed, bed bug area as well. We have quite. Dude, quite really? Issues. Well, I, I'm yeah, looking Denver's for. really hot for bed bugs. It's if one you of the find some bat bugs, I'm looking for them so I could put them in, put them in a collection. So, that, you know, okay, I'll, I'll pay I, you for them. I'm your, I'm your girl. I'll, 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 pay, you for, I'll pay you for those as well. And by the way, folks, I'm still looking for Norway rat scat. So uh, I'm still, I had people say, oh, we're going to send it to you. But of course, if the mail doesn't come, we know it's you. So, um, but I'm still looking. I pay $20 plus shipping. So there you go. I'm looking for Norway rat scat um, and wood rat scat if you can get that too. So uh, just to throw that out there. Anything uh, else that we should cover? Uh, last minute tips for 
you know, I think it might be good to go over again the fundamental advice for pesticide applicators and vertebrate pest controllers, what yeah, they should absolutely. do with their client, what they should do for themselves in this particular situation. Yeah, let's go through those major steps of, you know, just attempting, you know, control. Um, so you would want to inspect and I identify the area of, you know, possible kissing bug activity. That is that is very important. Um, removal of animal nesting areas within close proximity of structures is highly encouraged. Um, How close is close? How close is close? <laughs> 100 yards? 200 yards? I would say... I would say better? at least a hundred yards would be really yards. Okay. <laughs> smart to do a, a very formal <laughs> to do a very formal survey. And what what really becomes a problem is when, like in our area, with these, you know, there's a subdivision of homes that are all built with, right. you know, the, the front of the home looks like a home, but the back side and the interior walls of the home are all they're pretty much cave, fancy cave dwellings. Probably. Oh. So, so they I mean, went these, right up against the rock? There are parts of the interior of these homes, and all of them, almost all of them, have parts that are natural forming rock oh, walls. No, oh, no kidding. Planet. So oh, it's wow. even more of an issue. Um, within yeah, it's hard to seal, it's hard to seal that. Seal yeah. off. Exactly. Yeah. So it's really, you know, be smart about your build if you are going to build somewhere very extremely rural and more um in like a canyon canyon yeah. land area i would highly recommend making sure you you consider you know exclusionary <laughs> um, right. you know uh, build out your architecture in a way that you're thinking of excluding right. um mm -hmm. interactions with um, any pack rats that could be living up in those walls but um so you know getting back to this you know the master list of what you should do is i would say you know the removal of, you know, conditions uh, around a structure that may be attractive. So debris piles, you would really, especially in areas I know, like in Central and Southern America, that those are areas of refuge for these, right. um, for these kissing bugs. So yeah. in our area, I mean, if you have habitat that could be um, considered suitable for, for pack rats or wood rats, I would say get rid of it. Neat um, and clean. Neat and clean. Yes. Um, but exclusion from as much as you can exclude using a physical barrier like caulking or you know i would suggest folks need new windows with those really tight seals um even in areas like in central and southern america they don't even suggest people ha having wall hangings like they will say that even that little hole their walls oh, their man. walls yeah i mean having that hole with that nail entering the drywall i mean these these insects can come through that hole are you um, serious that's amazing. The nymphs can squeeze through that? They can squeeze through openings, very oh my tiny gosh. openings. So, that I mean, is it's really hard to protect, wow. you know, to keep a barrier. And you want to do everything you can to caulk and um, really, you know, to discourage physically the, you know, the entrance of, wow. of kissing okay. bugs. Okay. All right. That took but, it up a new level. All right. so that, means, that means traditional screening is not going to be enough. Yeah, I mean, I would think that they're such a flat insect. I mean, it's like similar with, you know, simicity with bed bugs and bat bugs. And um, they're such a flat insect that they can slide through um, tight openings, yeah, okay. unfortunately right. for us. Um, mm -hmm. Applications of insecticides, I would say, if, especially if you're in an area um, like these folks are, you know, south of Fruta and... Um, in these canyon areas, I would I would highly recommend that you know perimeter sprays would be done, and in the addition of you know actively managing those um, those wood rats with a, a pest management professional and regular checks too, because what happens is a pest management professional will come in and they'll they'll do great work getting rid of these wood rat middens, but um, and they'll go inactive, but without without those being properly sealed off, um, they mm -hmm. can be re-inhabited. Right. And so just having someone regularly check your area. So, I mean, for folks in this area, I actually, I, I recommend that they, every, every time they, you know, if they have been away from their home for a period of more than even two weeks, I would say you need to, you need to enter that house. Like it's been in lockdown and, and you have to check everything. Um, okay. And I would say that regular, you know, 
regular visits from pest management professionals would be encouraged. I mean, working closely with um, with someone to check those midden areas for activity would be. Would, be would you think monthly would be appropriate? And during the, obviously the warm period, I mean, I guess if you have getting sub-zero temperatures, I doubt the kissing bugs are doing a whole lot at that particular time. But, you know, let's just say. You know, I'd say multiple eight, times over a summer season would be. Yeah, multiple times. It's because they're. Because a nymph, a nymph would take how long to, to, and under ideal conditions, when would it want to convert to the next stage? I mean, it could be, I mean, with their life cycle being, you know, it's about an average of one to two months. Sometimes on the higher end, if things are pretty perfect, they okay. Can be so five, five changes so. in one to two months. So yeah, yeah, well, at least probably a monthly visit would probably be wise, if not. It just gets too expensive at a point, but it's it uh, does get expensive, and it's just um, I don't know if you're gonna if you're gonna build a home out out in the in the wildlands, you just should be prepared for what country you're gonna have to, yeah. to protect that space because I call it, really it the country is. tax. Yes. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt, <laughs> country, country tax. Okay, well, I if we haven't uh, heebie jeebie everyone out here today, uh, then we're glad that we're glad to have you stay along. So uh, we've been listening to uh, Melissa Schreiner. She's an ent entomologist from Colorado State University Extension. She's located in the Tri River area of Western Colorado, that's famous for its orchards. And so we've been talking today about the kissing bug. Uh, she called it's a uh, triatoma protracta so that's the one that's the nasty one i guess there's a lot of kissing bugs that are very beneficial for us but of course we're just focusing on the one negative one that's really associated with wood rats out there in western colorado so it does have shagus disease the parasite that causes it however fortunately it it's kind enough not to defecate where it bites however it might spread it can spread the disease to you but it's unlikely so we don't want to create paranoia with our clients we don't want to use fear tactics to sort of gouge your clients that's not ethical of course but we do need to make sure people are properly informed and you need to be informed in terms of how they're managing this particular insect and so always follow the label of course follow your state law for dealing with vertebrates just those normal caveats but definitely protect yourself and if you have a insect that you believe needs to be looked at more carefully you can certainly contact your local extension educator there in Colorado and uh, see if there is a, they can do an inspection of it and see it and then ship it up the chain to make sure an entomologist looks at it because a lot of them look the same. So a little bit of informative, uh, so not a lot of solutions right now. So hopefully we'll get some some more down the, down the road, because, but this disease is definitely something we want to prevent. But if you're doing exclusion, for people out there in the hinterlands up there against those rock cliffs and that's certainly some, going to be something that's going to be helpful for them and make sure you know caulk use your excluder co copper stuff it don't use your steel wool and harden that thing up like it's like it's a fort knox you don't even want water <laughs> going through it sure. but of course don't do it with weep vents just make sure things are excluded out so as much as possible so be careful with weep vents all right. Well, thank you very much for listening. So, hey, everyone, you've been listening to Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. We're really glad to have you on board here. So definitely take a time to uh, ring the bell, subscribe to the channel. You can also reach out to me at wildlifecontrolconsultant dot at gmail dot com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail dot com, and do join us on Facebook, of course, with the Pest Geek Podcast. And you've been listening to Living the Wildlife. Why we call it Living the Wildlife? Because we want you to live. The wildlife not be the wildlife take care everybody yes.